All right. Hello. I am not Dr. Christine Chung. I am John Michael Mayer um, and sent out the initial webinar, uh, information, educational information. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I'm proud to present Dr. Christine Chung, who is an assistant professor of medicine here at the Division of Cardiology at the University of Washington Medical Center. Um, she's primarily here at the University of Washington Montlake campus and supports our interventional cardiology program in our structural heart team. Um, and in that structural heart team, she has a, a specialized interest in the LAO procedure, which is what she's here to talk to you about today. Um, I will let her take it away from there. I will be managing the questions, the Q&A. You can submit questions anonymously if you'd like. Um, and I will help go through those. We might not get to every question today, um, but after the presentation, you'll have an opportunity to schedule a consult with Dr. Chung or talk to your cardiologist um, about this uh, option for your treatment. Uh, so I'll let Dr. Christine Chung take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, John Michael, for organizing this webinar um, and for manning the chat and Q&A uh, while we get started. Um, as John Michael uh, mentioned, my name is Dr. Chung, Christine Chung. I am an assistant professor of medicine here at the University of Washington. Um, I'm an interventional cardiologist, and that means that we treat problems in the heart through minimally invasive means, usually requiring catheters um, and wires to accomplish uh, similar and outcomes as to what was traditionally achieved only through open heart surgery. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about a really common problem, which is called atrial fibrillation. Um, it affects upwards of 10 million adults in the United States. Um, and specifically, we'll be focusing on one of the downstream consequences of atrial fibrillation, which is an increased risk of stroke. And the majority of the presentation today is going to be on talking through the various treatment options to reduce that stroke risk. And in particular, what the procedure called left atrial appendage closure can offer um, that is not uh, that is different from our traditional medical therapies. Um, I completed my training at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is one of the teaching hospitals of the Harvard Medical School and Columbia University in uh, New York City, um, and have been on faculty here um, for about two and a half years. Just gonna... How do I advance the slides? The space? Yeah, just the key. key. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, just to start, what is atrial fibrillation? So demonstrated on the left panel, you see a normal electrocardiogram um, and a normal heart rhythm is regular and a normal heart rate is around 60 to 80 beats per minute. The yellow fibers that you see there are the electrical wiring that allows that message to travel through the upper chambers of the heart down to the lower chambers and therefore coordinates the mechanical squeeze of the heart. On the right-hand side, you see the electrocardiogram of an atrial fibrillation rhythm. And the notable things there are that it's irregular and it's a little bit faster than the normal heart rate. So those are two things that often happen um, in atrial fibrillation is that people may be prone to bursts of high heart rates or um, what we call tachycardia, and that can manifest with symptoms like palpitations, shortness of breath, chest tightness, lightheadedness. Um, but the vast majority of people with atrial fibrillation don't experience any noticeable symptoms as a result of being in an irregular rhythm. And what we worry about more than uh, sort of the symptomatic components like palpitations are things like the increased risk of forming blood clots inside the heart, which can then lead to an increased risk of stroke. And then over the long run um, can increase the risk of heart failure. We won't be talking a lot about uh, the heart failure aspect today. And what we're really gonna hone in on is how to manage the stroke risk associated with atrial fibrillation. So how exactly does being in this irregular atrial fibrillation rhythm lead to stroke? So pictured on the right hand there is a cross section through the left atrial appendage. 
This is an outpouching of the left upper chamber of the heart. It's what's called a, a vestigial organ, just like the appendix in our intestine, meaning that it is present in everyone, but doesn't serve any um, clearly identified function. Um, but by virtue of being sort of off to the side and not part of the main chamber, it has less good blood flow. And pictured here, you can also see that there are lots of folds uh, leading to nooks and crannies in this particular outpouching. And in people with atrial fibrillation, those upper chambers of the heart, rather than contracting and emptying efficiently, the blood sort of tends to stagnate and pool. And uh, it loves to collect in this outpouching called the left atrial appendage. If a clot were to form in this appendage, some or part of it could break free, end up in the main pumping chambers of the heart, enter the circulation, um, and one of the first stops out of the heart is going to be up to the brain. And so if a clot lodges in a blood vessel supplying the brain, that's how a stroke can result. So it's estimated that up to 90% of stroke-causing clots in people with atrial fibrillation originate from this one particular part of the heart. As we talked about, the complications of atrial fibrillation are primarily uh, stroke and heart failure. And then as we'll talk about a bit more um, shortly, one of the ways that we treat the stroke risk is by having people on a blood thinner. And the downside risk of that is that it increases the risk of bleeding. And so people with atrial fibrillation often have more GI bleeding than the general population as well. And the risks of all of these things increase with advanced age. So the older we get and the longer we're, we're living with atrial fibrillation, the stroke risk, as well as the bleeding risk, both increase over time. So when managing atrial fibrillation, um, it really is a chronic condition that has to be managed over the long run in partnership with your doctors. Um, generally, it's going to be with a general cardiologist, but some people, particularly those in more remote areas, may manage a lot of this with the primary care provider. Um, and there are going to be two general goals of long-term treatment. One is going to be to control the atrial fibrillation rhythm and heart rate, and that can be done through specific medications. There are ones that control the heart rate, ones that control the heart rhythm. There are various approaches to controlling um, atrial fibrillation and how hard we try to get somebody out of it and back into a normal rhythm. Um, these are very individualized decisions made on a patient by patient basis. One of the ways that we can try to keep our hearts in a normal rhythm and kind of force it not to be in an irregular atrial fibrillation is through a procedure called ablation. The purpose of ablation is to break the abnormal electrical circuits in the left upper chamber of the heart that cause the rhythm to be irregular. This is a procedure that is done by my colleagues, um, also subspecialists called electrophysiologists. Um, and that is not a procedure that I do as a interventional cardiologist. Um, and so people that may be desiring and contemplating an ablation should seek out the consultative uh, services of an electrophysiologist. We'll move next to the second category of uh, long-term goals when it comes to managing atrial fibrillation, and that's going to be to reduce the stroke risk. So traditionally, the way that we did that was by starting our patients on a blood thinner. Blood thinners are highly effective, but they are blunt tools because it's not possible for us to only thin out the blood in the appendage. We have to thin out the blood in the entire body. And so hand in hand with the effectiveness of blood thinners comes a, a bleeding risk that is unavoidable. And so specifically in people who don't tolerate blood thinners well and who may have had bleeding problems, um, left atrial appendage closure is a particularly good alternative um, that we'll talk about in some detail. Some of you may have been switched at some point from a traditional blood thinner. Um, examples of these are things like Coumadin, Apixaban, 
Um, the brand name of that is Eloquis Rivaroxaban. The brand name of that one is Zarelto. And Dibigatran, the brand name is Pradaxa. Those are what we consider the uh, true blood thinners. Some people who may not have tolerated those well in the past may have been um, switched or, or placed on some alternative medications like aspirin or clopidogrel. It's important to distinguish between these two categories of medicines because we know that aspirin and its uh, more potent cousin clopidogrel, they block the platelet component of blood clots, whereas the blood thinners uh, block the production of the protein component. And clots are made up through cross-linking of these two components. So platelets bind to the proteins and then they all kind of bind together and that's what makes a clot. Well, we know that anti-platelet medicines, so things like aspirin, are not nearly as effective as true blood thinners at preventing the types of clots that occur in people with atrial fibrillation. So it really is an inadequate substitute. Um, aspirin and clopidogrel are good at blocking other types of clots, um, particularly those that can happen in our coronary arteries and patients that get stents. So there are different indications for which different medications are um, optimal. And for the purposes of reducing blood clot formation and reducing stroke risk in patients with atrial fibrillation, there really is no medication substitute for one of the anticoagulants that are listed there. As we talked about though, one of the um, tricky balances that we're always trying to manage in our patients with atrial fibrillation is balancing the risk of a stroke with the risk of a serious bleed. And so, you know, there truly is not a one size fits all approach. So in patients who have not done well with blood thinners um, or who may be felt to be so high risk that they were not even ever attempted um, on a blood thinner, there is a non-medication treatment alternative, which is a one-time procedure called left atrial appendage occlusion or closure. Just to walk through the basic uh, steps of the procedure, um, we put in one of the two devices pictured here at the opening of that outpouching, and it basically serves as a plug to cap off that opening so that any clots that may form uh, behind the device in the appendage cannot escape through. Both FDA approved commercially available devices have a fabric component that has a really fine mesh. So any significant clot will not be able to pass through. And then over time, the way that both devices lead to complete closure is that the body will deposit a new layer of tissue on the surface of the device that ultimately results in a complete seal. There are multiple randomized control trials that both devices had to go through in order to get FDA approval. Um, and they showed that the devices are equally as effective as traditional blood thinners, things like Coumadin, um, at preventing the stroke risk related to atrial fibrillation, but they come with the long-term benefit of reduced risk of bleeding. So to dive a little bit deeper into what somebody might um, expect if they were to undergo this procedure, so it is minimally invasive. This is not an open heart surgery, so there are no incisions being made in the chest or in the heart. Everything is done minimally invasively. We do, um, for the majority of patients, do this procedure under general anesthesia. And the reason for that is because in order to see the appendage and appropriately size the appendage and position and place the device, we need a camera that goes behind the heart through the food pipe, the esophagus, and that ultrasound camera, um, in order to tolerate that being down, we put people to sleep so that they're not uncomfortable from having that camera down. We go in through a vein in the groin, which ultimately connects up to those upper chambers of the heart and allows us to access the appendage. Um, the whole procedure from start to finish, from the time you are wheeled into the room, put to sleep, have all the equipment positioned, the, the device placed, and then woken up is about an hour. 
And then the majority of our patients do stay overnight for monitoring, um, but we have safely discharged people home the same day as well um, for those who prefer that option. Using a standard percutaneous technique, the implanting physician inserts a guide wire and vessel dilator into the patient's femoral vein. Then, using a standard transeptal access system, the physician crosses the interatrial septum. The physician advances the access sheath over the guide wire into the left atrium and navigates it into the distal portion of the left atrial appendage over a pigtail catheter. The physician then deploys and releases the watchman device. The device gradually endothelializes to permanently seal off the patient's LAA. So that's just a animated um, depiction of how the procedure would go. Um, this particular video is showing the watchman device, but the procedural steps are very similar for the amulet device as well. So both devices are placed in a similar way. I just wanted to show an example of a patient that I recently treated um, and just give you a visualization of um, what the main procedural steps are. So most of our patients are getting worked up at the time um, of their clinic visit with a cardiac CT. Um, this is a imaging scan that you know takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes and is much easier for people to tolerate than something um, you know like an MRI, which takes a lot longer. And the main purpose of this CT is to give us a 3D reconstruction of the appendage because it is so variable in size and shape. Um, they say that the appendage is like a fingerprint, uh, no two are the same. And so it is helpful to have a 3D uh, rendering of it so that we know exactly what we're dealing with. And then we make some measurements of the uh, diameter of the opening, the depth of the appendage, all of which factors into our choice and selection of device. At the time of the procedure, um, I had mentioned that we image the appendage using an ultrasound camera that goes down the throat. Um, so these, this is an example of what the appendage looks like using that imaging modality and how we use these images to obtain further sizing measurements. And then this is just an example of, um, at the time of the procedure, what the device looks like as it's being uh, positioned and then the, the pictures that we take to ensure uh, that we are happy with the way everything looks. And then um, in the room at the time of the procedure, when we're done, um, everything other than the device gets taken out of the body. Uh, the patient is woken up on the table, the breathing tube comes out, um, and then uh, the patient gets wheeled out to the recovery area. And then what can you expect in the days and weeks following the procedure? Um, so one of the main things that we talk about at the time of a consultation to discuss um, whether or not an LAO procedure may be right for you is to talk about what the medication regimen is going to be following the device going in. Um, so as you uh, may recall from our um, previous uh, slides, we do have a period of a few weeks to a month or two where the body is covering the surface of the device with uh, new tissue. And in that period, because both, both devices are made up of some combination of metal and fabric, we wanna make sure that there are no clots forming on the surface of the device itself um, because the body will see it as a foreign uh, material. And so um, one of the things that we are gonna tailor to each uh, patient is what is the right medication to continue people on. Um, many times, unless there's been a true, um, you know, really major bleeding problem, we will try to keep people on their original blood thinner, um, whether it's Coumadin or Apixaban. Um, and then in cases where somebody may have had such a major bleed that they are currently off of everything, so that's not an uncommon scenario, we'll talk through what the pros and cons are of the various treatment regimens. And as long as the risk is not felt to be excessively high, often because it's a relatively short period of about six weeks that we're talking about continuing the blood thinner, um, in most cases, it will be appropriate to just continue that. Um, but there are um, situations in which an alternative regimen might be felt to be safer. So what is an alternative regimen? Sometimes we do aspirin plus clopidogrel for 45 days. 
And then there are um, certain cases where we might just do clopidogrel alone or aspirin alone. So again, these are very um, individualized decisions that really take into account what people's bleeding history has been and what are other underlying medical problems that may contribute to the bleeding versus clotting risk profile for each patient. So that medication gets continued for about 45 days. And then at that point, we bring people back for a uh, follow-up imaging study of their device. Um, our standard at this time has been to look at the device with the transesophageal echo. That's the camera that goes down the throat. Um, but there are cases in which we'll follow um, these devices with a CAT scan instead. Um, and the things that we're looking for are to make sure that there's no gap around the device, that there's no leaking around the device. We're looking for a complete effective seal. And then we're also checking to make sure that there's no clotting or anything on the surface of the device itself. The vast majority, upwards of 95% of patients in the clinical studies that have been treated with either device had complete successful closure at 45 days, meaning that for those who were continued on a blood thinner, they can usually stop it at that time. Um, and this is not a novel or experimental procedure. It's been around for many years, and there are hundreds of thousands of patients um, that have been treated effectively and safely with this procedure. So in terms of determining what is the right treatment for you as an individual, um, there really needs to be ultimately um, an in-depth discussion um, with a uh, implanting doctor, so that would be someone like me, as well as a primary care doctor or a general cardiologist that has been involved in your care. Um, and we look to see that your atrial fibrillation is not related to a heart valve disorder. Um, so that would be somebody with, for instance, severe mitral stenosis, that's blockage of one of the valves in the heart, um, people who have atrial fibrillation related to an underlying valve disorder such as that are generally better treated, more effectively treated against their risk of stroke by being on a blood thinner. So not everybody with atrial fibrillation is going to be a suitable candidate for this procedure. But for those uh, for whom that sort of qualification does not apply, which is the majority of people with atrial fibrillation, um, the best uh, candidates for this are going to be those who have had bleeding problems, um, who really are not good candidates to stay on blood thinners long term because the risk of bleeding starts to outweigh um, the prevent prevention against stroke benefit. Um, increasingly, there are also people who, even if they have not had a major uh, bleed on a blood thinner, they may have difficulty taking blood thinners. So, for instance, People for whom the monthly copay for the newer blood thinners like Apixaban, um, you know, so for some people it can run into the hundreds of thousands, hundreds of dollars per month, um, even after the insurance uh, coverage. And so for some people it is unaffordable um, in the intermediate term to stay on these blood thinners. There are also some people who have various lifestyle considerations. So people who are really um, athletically active. I've had patients who are downhill skiers and. Um, mountain bikers who really have felt the need to hold back from these activities that they really enjoy because of the fear of a major um, injury and the potential for major bleeding if they were to have an injury. Um, so there are people who are good candidates for this procedure, even if they have not already experienced a major bleed, they may be at particularly high risk of having a major bleed or for other considerations may not be a good candidate to be on a blood thinner indefinitely. So what are some of the uh, conditions for which left atrial appendage closure may not be a good option? So there are some people who may have had uh, major allergic reactions uh, to nickel or titanium. Um, those people may not be a good uh, candidate for left atrial appendage closure because all of our available devices use those components in their construction. Um, there are some patients whose appendage may be either too small or too big to be effectively closed with one of our available devices. I will say this is exceedingly rare, um, but it is one of the things that we look for on that screening CAT scan. 
Um, both commercially available devices come in a very wide range of sizes, and so the majority of appendages will be suitable for closure from an anatomic standpoint. And then an important group here um, are going to be those that require blood thinners for a condition other than atrial fibrillation. And the reason for this is that one of the reasons to have this procedure done is because we want to protect you against stroke risk while being able to get you off the blood thinner, <clears throat> excuse me, and protect you against the long-term bleeding risk. And so anybody that needs to stay on a blood thinner for some other indication is not going to get the maximal benefit of this procedure. So what are some examples of common conditions that may require long-term blood thinner use? So those would be people with mechanical heart valves. So at this time, there really is no effective, equally effective alternative uh, than just being on Coumadin for people with mechanical heart valves. There are also some people who may have had uh, recurrent blood clots, particularly those that went to the lungs that really need to be on a blood thinner long term to address some sort of underlying clotting uh, disorder or uh, predisposition to clotting. So those people would need to stay on a blood thinner long term. And even if we were to close the appendage, they would not be able to come off their blood thinners. So those people you know, are probably not going to be best suited to undergo this procedure. The vast majority of patients um, who we do see in our clinics for atrial fibrillation um, who are being considered for this procedure are going to be eligible for insurance coverage. Those that have Medicare um, generally are all gonna be covered. And then the vast majority of commercial insurance providers also um, cover this procedure. We do have a dedicated um, team that screens um, and submits prior authorization so that um, you will know upfront what your um, coverage is gonna be. And if there's going to be any um, issues with getting coverage, we will address all of that before we bring you in for the procedure. So there are no unexpected uh, charges and costs on the back end. So as we conclude here and open up um, for some questions and interaction uh, with the audience, I just want to point you to some helpful resources that uh, you can peruse and go through in your spare time. So the Heart Rhythm Society is uh, one of the national professional societies for the electrophysiologists. So those are the heart rhythm doctors that can perform ablation procedures. The American Heart Association is uh, one of our largest uh, national professional societies for all of cardiology, so for all heart doctors and heart specialists. Um, and then the two um, bottom links go to the uh, websites that are uh, managed by the companies that make the devices. Uh, Watchman uh, is going to have only information specific to the Watchman device, and then the amulet will only have information specific to the amulet. But for those of you that may want to see some additional um, animations and videos and kind of look through some um, patient-oriented reading materials, um, you'll be able to find those on those uh, company websites. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to learn about this condition and to learn about this procedure. Um, we will open it up now for questions. Um, John Michael is going to help moderate that. Um, and as you can see on the screen, there is a QR code here as well as a URL that you can visit. If um, based on uh, the aforementioned criteria, you think you might be a suitable um, candidate to consider for this procedure, I'd be happy to see you in the clinic um, and walk through uh, your personal treatment options and how this might fit into uh, your long-term management of atrial fibrillation. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Again, if you do want to use that QR code, just pull out your phone if you're on a computer um, and you can scan that with your phone camera and it'll take you to that link or use the link underneath. Um, one of the questions we'll get started with is just the difference. There are two options available for this procedure, the Watchman and Amulet. Can you talk a little bit more about the size of each and what the difference are between them? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, just by virtue of the way our uh, FDA approval system works um, and the way that as compared to places like Europe and Canada, 
the Watchman really has been the um, longtime market leader just because it got approved many years ago and much earlier than the Amulet device. And so in terms of our cumulative experience here in the United States, um, the vast majority of us are going to have a lot more experience with the Watchman device just because it's been around a lot longer. It was approved back in the 20 teens. Um, and we're now on the second generation um, of that device, which is uh, both safer and more effective than the earlier generation. Um, and so for a lot of people, a lot of anatomies, um, it's gonna be a good device and a good option. The Amulet device has been around a lot longer in Europe and Canada and is actually the market leader in Europe. And so I think, you know, just highlighting that there really, uh, for a lot of people, is not going to be, uh, you know, one clear uh, device that's obviously better. For many anatomies, they're both going to be suitable. There are certain anatomic considerations, for instance, the 3D shape of the lobes of the appendage, how wide versus how shallow it is. There are certain anatomies that are going to be better suited for treatment with one device by the versus the other. Um, but for the majority of anatomies, both devices will be suitable and um, will really depend on review of the CT scan. Great. How about, um, is this procedure a good one for atrial flutter versus fibrillation? Yeah, so a uh, great question. Atrial flutter is a very closely related cousin to atrial fibrillation. They are both irregular heart rhythms that originate from the upper chambers of the heart. Um, and they are both thought to confer uh, similar risks of stroke. And so regardless of whether you have atrial fibrillation versus atrial flutter, in general, um, many patients with these irregular heart rhythms are going to need to be on either a blood thinner or have some sort of treatment addressing their uh, increased risk of stroke. Now, there are some people who have these irregular heart rhythms who, by virtue of their overall medical profile, so for instance, people who are very young in their 50s, early 60s, and by virtue of not having really any other chronic heart conditions, their personal risk of stroke related to these irregular rhythms may be low enough that they don't need to be on a blood thinner. So again, this is where the need for um, individual consultation comes in to really understand your personal stroke risk related to your atrial fibrillation or flutter um, and how that risk compares to the risk of bleeding over the long term with being on a traditional blood thinner. Okay. Uh, you talked a little bit about some of the changes in uh, lifestyle changes and behavioral changes to support some of these issues. Is there any changes needed before getting the procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So there has been some data to show that certain um, behavioral and lifestyle changes can help reduce the burden, meaning how likely you are to be in AFib and when it does happen, how long you stay in it, especially for people who have the version of atrial fibrillation where they're going in and out of it. So that's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. An important one here is alcohol use. So in general, um, less than eight alcoholic beverages per week um, is going to be a helpful threshold to try to stay under to reduce the overall burden of atrial fibrillation. Um, and I think, you know, it is probably going to be important, you know, for instance, to stay under the eight drinks per week uh, threshold. I don't think it's equivalent to have, you know, one drink every other day versus like three or four drinks at one time. So generally what you're going to be aiming for there is minimizing your alcohol consumption, really trying to stick to just, you know, one at most two drinks at a time, and then trying to stay under the eight drink per week limit. Um, and then other things that can be helpful are um, moderate cardiovascular exercise to lose weight. Um, so weight loss uh, can also help uh, reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation. For, for people who, uh, you know, don't yet have atrial fibrillation, Things like controlling blood pressure and uh, weight loss can help reduce the risk of developing atrial fibrillation. Uh, which procedure is more invasive or talk a little bit about the, the risks of both the uh, ablation procedure and then also this uh, LAO procedure? Yeah, so both ablation and left atrial appendage closure similarly take place in those upper chambers of the heart. So a lot of the procedural setup is very similar, meaning 
general anesthesia, um, tubes that go into the, the veins in the groin, having catheters or plastic tubes inside those upper chambers of the heart. Um, ablation is done through what's called electrical mapping. So there are certain um, devices that the electrophysiologists use to create a map inside each person's heart to see where the irregular rhythms are being generated and carried along. And then they have different tools to try to interrupt those pathways. Um, so all of that is unique to an ablation. We don't do any of that in a left atrial appendage closure procedure, but they do take place in the same uh, region of the heart. So I can't really speak to the specific um, procedural risks and complications of ablation because it's not a procedure that I do. Um, we do have wonderful electrophysiologists here at our institution um, that would be happy to talk to those of you that are considering an ablation. Um, and specifically, uh, Dr. Nazim Akum um, and Dr. Arun Sridhar are two of our electrophysiologists that perform both ablation procedures as well as left atrial appendage closure procedures for people that are good candidates for both. Great. Um, in terms of just rejection or the, the contraindications, nitinol uh, allergy, um, how, how do you test for that? And are there any other reasons your body might reject this device? Yeah, so great question. Um, it turns out that skin reactions to nickel are extremely common in the general population. It's thought that you know somewhere around thirty to forty percent of the general population, if you put you know cheap nickel jewelry on the skin um, or you know tape nickel to the skin, that it would cause a rash. Now, what we don't know and what we don't have good evidence and data about is how does that predict and correlate to the risk of a system-wide reaction in somebody that gets a implanted device that contains a combination of nickel? We do not routinely screen for nickel allergy um, because again, how to translate that into the risk of a heart device is unknown. Um, and so it is not our routine practice, nor is it recommended in any of our treatment guidelines to routinely screen for nickel. So the way that I personally have sort of, um, you know, taken that into account is in people who come to me and say, hey, I've had a lifelong history of really severe allergic reactions to nickel. Um, then we might proceed with a formal allergy evaluation and get formal um, skin testing. And then we have a conversation about how to balance the unknowns uh, and the risks and benefits of, of going forward. And I think the you know, benefit of going forward, even in the light of a uh, positive skin test, really depends on that individual patient's stroke and bleeding risk profile. Um, in, in terms of whether this stops or reduces uh, the experiences of, of AFib, or if you can have additional ablation procedures after this procedure, what, what are some of those indications? Yeah, great question, and it's one that comes up a lot. So it's important to distinguish between treatments that address the irregular rhythm of atrial fibrillation itself. So those are things like ablation, versus things like left atrial appendage closure that specifically reduce only the stroke risk related to atrial fibrillation. So having your appendage closed does not take you out of atrial fibrillation, and it doesn't um, in any way directly impact on you know, how likely you are to be in atrial fibrillation versus going in and out of it. So those are two completely um, separate, separate considerations. Um, in terms of pacemakers, are there any contraindications if you do have a pacemaker currently? Yeah, no, there's no um, contraindication to somebody having this procedure if you have a pacemaker in place. Um, many people with atrial fibrillation, as they get older, end up having slow rather than overly fast heart rates. And so it is quite common for our older patients with atrial fibrillation at some point to then end up with a pacemaker. So there's no um, contraindication to having this procedure done if you have a pacemaker. Um, and then just in terms of your expertise and, uh, and supporting any frequent procedurally related issues that have come up. Yeah. So 
two of the uh, sort of direct procedure related complications that were seen, uh, especially with the first generation Watchman device was um, one, uh, injury to the heart tissue while the device was being positioned such that there was a small tear made in the wall of the heart and then bleeding around the heart that you know needed to be drained um, and in the worst case scenario needed to have a surgical intervention in order to definitively stop the bleeding. So that procedural complication was seen in up to 2% of patients who were undergoing the procedure with the first generation device. With the newer generation Watchman device, which we've been using for almost two years now, um, that the rate of that complication is less than 0.5%. So it has become an extremely rare complication, um, although certainly remains you know, theoretically possible. But one of the main changes that was made to the newer generation Watchman device is that rather than having uh, spikes as the part of the device that comes out first into the heart, you have a closed end or a ball um, that is soft and non-traumatic and flexible. Um, so the likelihood of causing injury to the heart tissue while you're positioning the device has really, um, really become very, very low. The other um, thing that can happen is um, bleeding at the groin access site. Um, the way we manage that is by putting in a stitch um, and then holding some additional pressure um, and uh, keeping patients on bed rest to make sure that the groin fully heals. Um, the risk of a major bleed um, is qu also quite low, um, and certainly any bleeding that would require an additional intervention um, to stop the bleeding, also less than 0.5%. Other things that can happen, it's always theoretically possible that the device could pop out and end up um, coming out of the appendage and then traveling downstream in the circulation to somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Um, so the risk of that is also 0.5% um, and is one of those things that, again, is theoretically possible but, but rarely seen in clinical practice because we have gained a lot of experience at appropriately sizing and positioning the device uh, to make sure that these things don't happen. Um, how about just efficiency? Does this impact efficiency to heart flow or heart pump flow? No, it really has no um, direct impact on the circulation and on the, um, the way the heart works overall. And so the um, activity restrictions that we recommend for people after the procedure uh, generally is going to be to take it easy for a week to week or two and avoid any heavy lifting and avoid any strenuous exertion. Um, but that is all really about making sure the groin heals completely. Um, it's not directly related to the heart and it doesn't, um, you know, stress the heart and impact the device healing um, in any way. Great. Um... How about with the mitra clip? If you have any other implants within your heart, what, what does that look like with having the LAL or a PFO closure? Yeah, so if um, if patients have had a PFO closure, those devices sit on that dividing wall between the two upper chambers of the heart. And uh, depending on where we need to cross that wall in order to have a good trajectory and angle into the appendage, there may be a chance that we have to go through the PFO device. That is something that has been done and has been described um, in the literature and that we've um, seen people be able to do. I personally have not encountered that uh, situation yet, but we have ways of managing that and getting through these devices safely. Um, if people have a mitra clip, there is no um, direct impact on this uh, procedure at all, and it's not uncommon um, for people to have had other implanted cardiac devices and still be suitable for an, a left atrial appendage procedure. Um, With uh, with having the procedure, do you ever work with your electrophysiology partners to do an ablation at the same time? Yeah, so there are cases where we may try to do both procedures at once. Um, I have had cases where I have done the procedure jointly with one of my electrophysiology colleagues, and they've done the ablation component, and I've done the left atrial closure component. 
Um, there are pros and cons to every um, approach, and uh, those are things that we can specifically address in a, in a clinic visit. Um, and then how about just, I know you talked about the, the week out. Does it affect your performance in any way outside of that week of recovery? No, uh, once the groin has fully healed, um, there really wouldn't be any sort of expected impact on your function. Um, it also would not be expected to impact how you feel. So this is not a procedure that is going to necessarily make you feel better. So for patients who have atrial fibrillation, and who have sort of chronic shortness of breath, this is not a procedure that is going to address those symptoms of shortness of breath. It's really the goal of this procedure is to reduce your lifetime risk of stroke with the benefit of being able to come off a blood thinner. Uh, is there, can you have an MRI with this device or any other diagnostic? Yeah, great question. So um, most of our permanent heart devices um, and the left atrial appendage closure devices fall into this category. They have what's called an MRI conditional labeling. And what that means is for most standard MRI scanners, they're going to use either a one and a half or three Tesla magnet, just referring to the strength of the magnet. Um, up to that level, they're going to be safe to get scanned. The Companies sort of for legal purposes put this conditional um, qualifier on there because it's theoretically possible that there could be a stronger magnet out there that they have not tested the device for safety with before the vast majority of circumstances, it will be safe uh, in a standard scanner. Um, how about for newly diagnosed patients for those that have other already tried other therapies? We talked a little bit about this, but um, are there any indications to support that type of person? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the current recommendations from our professional guidelines, so those are the broad um, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. The current recommendations are that for people who have atrial fibrillation, who have an elevated stroke risk as determined by an assessment of an individual patient's risk using various risk calculators that we have, that for people who can tolerate a blood thinner and are reasonable candidates, the first line of treatment is going to be to try a blood thinner. Now, there are some cases where someone will be newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and off the bat are considered too high risk to ever even try a blood thinner, those patients are certainly likely to be suitable for a left atrial appendage closure procedure. Um, but for somebody who does not have really a uh, high risk profile to try a blood thinner and has never tried a blood thinner, probably the right thing for those people is going to be to at least try a blood thinner and see you know, how you feel, how you do, how you tolerate it. Um, is there any risk of this leaking over time um, uh, in terms of the device? Because it is a permanent device, correct? Yes, it's a permanent device. Um, the reason why we study the device at 45 days, uh, in addition to obviously the pictures that we take at the time of the implantation, or that we want to see as the body is adapting to it and healing, that um, it is uh, healing well and that the body is not uh, sort of pulling away from the device and causing gaps around the device that can cause residual leaking. So that's one of the things that we evaluate for. Again, in multiple clinical trials, um, looking at that 45-day follow-up period, over 95% of people had successful closure with the device. So the rate of significant residual leaks is very low. If AFib is, we have a question of if AFib is well controlled by medication, are we still at higher risk for stroke? Yeah, great question. So the answer is yes. Um, atrial fibrillation can be well controlled from a heart rate standpoint. It can be well controlled from a symptom standpoint, meaning that you're not experiencing palpitations but the stroke risk is independent of all of that. So just by virtue of having atrial fibrillation, um, there is a strong association with age, 
and then certain other chronic heart conditions like high blood pressure that contribute to a person's annual risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation, it really has nothing to do with how well the rate and the rhythm are controlled. Is there, in terms of alcohol and coffee use, is there any indication of AFib or blood clotting be affected by alcohol, caffeine, anything else like that? So there's really no correlation between um, sort of substances and then the stroke risk. Again, to sort of separate out the issues of the symptomatic components of atrial fibrillation, the palpitations from the stroke risk, they're not related to each other at all. Um, so the presence or absence of one does not impact on the other. Um, but the use of caffeine, alcohol for certain people may really impact on their likelihood to have symptomatic palpitations. It may um, impact them having more frequent or more prolonged episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, so the association between atrial fibrillation burden and caffeine, I think, is less well established, but there is a um, better established connection with alcohol. Um, is there any, in, in bay, weighing the risk of general anesthesia and also with the follow-up uh, transesophageal uh, uh, imaging, you do have to go under general anesthesia for that, correct? Um, so actually to clarify, for the 45-day follow-up echo, we do not use general anesthesia. So those patients just get what we call moderate or conscious sedation. So what that means is you'll get a peripheral IV, um, you'll get some pain medicine and a relaxant to sort of make sure that you're comfortable. Um, and then the procedure is done just with sort of that level of twilight sedation. Um, a comparable level of sedation would be something like a colonoscopy. Um, and the reason for that difference is that those follow-up studies are much shorter. And so because the camera doesn't need to be down as long, the whole procedure is uh, less uncomfortable. It's generally better tolerated. So there's no need for general anesthesia for the follow-up study. There are certain patients who may have um, issues with their esophagus. So for instance, some people have strictures, um, other people for various reasons may not tolerate having the camera down the throat. And we do have other imaging modalities to support those patients still getting this procedure done safely. Um, and just to confirm, someone was told potentially by their cardiologist that uh, the use of aspirin after Watchman was the protocol. Is this now cur a current protocol as well? Um, so um, there is sort of no short answer to this. So I'm gonna go a little bit into detail. So in the original protocols in the clinical trials that led to approval of the Watchman device, aspirin was used in combination with the blood thinner. Back when the device was first being studied in the early 2010s, all that was available was Coumadin. So the newer agents like Apixaban and Rivaroxaban were not yet available for um, commercial use. And so all the original clinical trials of the first generation Watchman device were tested against Coumadin. And in those protocols, that it was combined with aspirin. Nowadays, most of our patients are on one of the newer blood thinners and fewer and fewer people are on Coumadin. Um, we don't generally uh, combine aspirin uh, with a blood thinner unless people have a separate indication to be on a antiplatelet therapy. So an example of that would be coronary disease. Um, and in general, uh, my uh, personal practice is that I don't combine aspirin as a new medicine with the blood thinner in people that were not previously on it or that don't have another reason to be on it. Now, there is a transition therapy after that 45-day period when we switch people onto a combination of aspirin and clopidogrel. Again, that's the regimen that was used in the clinical trials. And so at that point, people will be on an aspirin. And then at six months, the protocol for most people is going to be to stop the clopidogrel and then continue on just a baby, 81 milligram daily dose of aspirin indefinitely. And again, there are always going to be sort of outlier and one-off cases. So there are certain cases in which I take people off everything, including aspirin, um, in those situations where people are extremely high risk for bleeding. Uh, a question about THC or CBD use. Um, I don't think of there being any direct uh, connection with THC or CBD use with 
um, sort of stroke risk related to atrial fibrillation and don't think it would directly impact on uh, somebody's suitability for it. Um, get a couple more questions here done. We're getting to the close of time. And just so everyone knows, we'll make sure that this presentation um, and all the questions are answered and sent in a follow-up email um, so that you have all this information available. So apologize if we don't get to everybody's questions here by the end of the, the time we have. Um, why don't we end? Is there ever a reason that this would be removed? And can it be removed? Yeah, so the only way that a device like this could be removed um, once there's been any significant passage of time would be surgical. Um, so it would have to be, you know, essentially cut out of the heart. Um, I really can't think of a great reason why that would be necessary. The, the only situation that comes to mind is if somebody were to have some sort of major systemic adverse reaction that was really felt to be directly attributable to the device. Um, I have not heard of there ever being a situation like that. Um, and it's not something that I have seen reported in the literature. It just comes to mind as a theoretically possible scenario. Okay, while we end with, while we end, with uh, questions, so does the ideal result of the LAO mean that I can do away with my blood thinners, assuming a positive outcome and no other extenuating factors? Yes, absolutely. That's the whole purpose of the procedure is to substitute the need for a long-term blood thinner that has bleeding risk with a one-time procedure that has been proven to be equally effective while enabling you to stop the blood thinner permanently. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chung, for spending the time with everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, again, if you would like to talk to Dr. Christine Chung specifically about your situation, um, you can use that link there or the QR code. Um, and we will also send a follow-up email with these links uh, to be able to support uh, any follow-up questions that you may have. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you.